So today we'll be going over airway obstruction, oxygenation, ventilation, and suction. It's kind of a catch-all for many of the airway procedures that we end up doing. And it's going to be going over a number of different things as well as looking at some of the disease processes that can be involved or other pathophysiologies uh, to include something as simple as foreign body airway obstruction or vomit, things like that. So it's a little bit of a catch-all, but we'll start be going over this and it should be worked uh, pretty well. So we're first going to start off with uh, respiratory pathophysiology and there's a lot of different type of conditions that can cause respiratory compromise and hypoxia. Some things that you'll notice throughout many of my slides, whether in this class, trauma or otherwise, is that I try to show you guys a few different imagery, particularly radiology based imagery, uh, in especially some of the chest x-rays and things like that, uh, not expecting any expertise on reading x-rays or anything else but by recognizing some of the things you see whether it's an ift going out even for a 911 type call and you go there and they might have some type of imagery done we can it gives us a pretty decent idea of what's actually going on with the patient and what as well as we when we look at some of the anatomy physiology and uh, pathophys such as pneumos ards different things like that gives us an idea of what's actually going on on that. So we'll kind of, you'll notice a decent amount of x-rays going through. So at least by the end of this, you're going to have somewhat familiarity with uh, some of these. So we'll start off with our upper airway obstruction. Uh, it's a common cause of poor ventilation is upper airway obstruction. There's can be a number of things and it can be from foreign body airway obstructions to different types of vomiting, um, blood, things like that. It can be pretty decently common in patients who are conscious, typically by, it, when, in this case, by inhalation, inhalation of foods, foreign bodies, fluids, vomitus, blood, saliva, all types of, whatever gets in their mouth they can drink, uh, it can end up there. So we can think of, in class, we'll talk about some of the different things that we can find um, in both pediatric and adult patients. We see these particularly a lot in pediatric patients. So foreign body airway obstructions, the FBAO, uh, typically there's about 4,500 deaths each year from some type of foreign body airway obstruction. And it's some type of obstruction typically in the upper airway, although sometimes it can migrate down to the lower airway. And it's a pretty big one. Uh, some of these pictures here on the right, we can see they are different types of objects located in different parts of our airway. And what it all looks like once it's inside the airway itself. And so as we look here, some of the different ones, we can see how it just the, gets stuck in different parts of here. A lot of these that we look over here, such as B, C, or especially B is right on the carina, something's in there. Some of the uh, items are more identifiable than others. And these are all typically done by a bronchoscope, which you'll see in the uh, ICU more than anything else. Obviously, you can see them in an OR suite too, but uh, many times what they go down and see the bottom left there down in G looks to be some type of maybe like a P or something else where uh, the, the bronchoscope has the ability to grab and remove things from the uh, lower upper or lower airway. So airway obstruction in a conscious patient, about 80% or approximately 90, uh, sorry, 30,000 deaths each year from foreign body aspiration occur in children. Most aspiration foreign bodies are found in the right main stem, bronchus, and lower lobe. Uh, some of these pictures don't do it as well. We'll try and find, I think I have some in here which actually show how, why the, we always talk about a right main stem. The right main stem is more straight and down, and the left main stem tends to have a little bit of a diversion over. Uh, turns more laterally. And so even when our tube goes too deep, it almost always goes uh, right main stem. Sometimes it can go left main stem, but most foreign objects as they go down will end up in the lower right main stem. The issue with that particular foreign body airway obstructions, if it's some type of foreign body in there, remember we only have two lobes on our left and three lobes on our right. So if we're gonna, if we had a side that we wish was not getting ventilated as much, it would probably have, rather have the left side, a little bit more oxygen exchange capability on the right. 
Let's look at some of these pieces that they'll pull out and what they would what they'll get in there. I forgot what some of these end up being, but the bottom two, I believe, are grapes or something similar, uh, some type of fruit over there. I'm not sure exactly what that object is in the upper left ones, but uh, we also, so a couple things that we'll do is classify them into whether it is a partial or complete airway obstruction. Uh, patients with a complete airway obstruction cannot speak, or another name for that is phonia, exchange air, or cough, where a partial airway obstruction, which we look up in B or D, uh, or sorry, B or A in the pictures, where air can get past, just it is blocking the amount of air that we're able to exchange. So although upper airway may lead to loss of consciousness, cardiopulmonary arrest and state of unconsciousness, a state of, of unconsciousness itself may cause the airway obstruction. That's when we're talking about the tongue. So the tongue is attached to the mandible by the muscles that form the floor of the mouth. We can look over here and it is a lot of muscles and a big awkward thing. We always think of the tongue being kind of its own little thing, but it's this huge um, muscle and it has a lot with that. And so we talk about this, we're going to look over and notice that um, when you become unconscious, that tongue loses, much like we lose the, most of the rest of our muscle tone in our body, we also lose muscle tone on the tongue, so it tends to fall back, and it will block our entire airway, both nasal and oral. And that's why we, the NPA and OPA work as well as they do, uh, is because they address that. And so we'll look at a few different things that can kind of cause some of these airway obstructions besides the tongue itself. Um, so another thing that we'll have within our body is that can cause a blockage. So we'll call laryngeal spasm and laryngeal and or pharyngeal or laryngeal edema. And laryngeal spasm, I have a video on here that watch in class. It doesn't show up on the lectures, but on the recorded lectures, but what it does is it causes a spasming of the vocal cords which disallow air to move through. There's like a there's one version of this which is real kind of common as far as these go. It's not necessarily common overall, but it will close when they try to breathe and then open when they don't. And so it's counter kind of breathing for them. And it's a it's one of the issues that we really have with these um, and where paralytics are extremely important, but we don't have those because you can't count them because it's really difficult to get a tube through that when the when the cords are spasming like this. Um, some of the edema that can come is swelling into glottic and subglottic tissues of the airway that can close off the larynx. And so try and think of some issues that can cause this and what can make this difficult. Um, some of the ones that we talked about previously, uh, any type of angioedema, swelling of the tissues in and around the uh, larynx and pharynx and upper throat uh, and our um, throat anywhere in there what it does is make it difficult and so if we look on both of these pictures a and b that's where we're seeing some angioedema or uh, pharyngeal edema and it's just swelling it becomes very difficult to get a tube through there and this is one of those ones where a bougie might be best and we might be getting a size or two smaller on the tube itself as well um this is one, another one where we want uh, whoever's your best innovator is going to be going for this. And you're going to get basically one shot because as soon as we stick a lone just blade in there, everything's going to get swollen worse and um, possibly close up. And our only option then is a correct thoracotomy. So another type that you can be aware of is what they call a, are from a fractured larynx. You can see some of the difficulty that, and imagine some of the issues that can come from something like this. Uh, when we look over it here, obviously we lose a ton of the stability and uh, structure in around there and areas that we would previously be kind of looking for are no longer available for us to try and identify for, um, to innovate or it just makes it all much more difficult bleeding swelling as well that can be in there so it's a rather difficult uh, issue i haven't seen this one as much i don't think i've actually tubed anybody with a broken larynx or fractured larynx uh, but typically that area as you can see is uh, external trauma to the larynx is mbc and 
uh, getting throat punch, something like that. Also very much so. So some things to look out for. This one's pretty interesting is that when we're looking at trauma to the tracheal area, uh, we see a couple areas that tend that where the trachea tends to be injured. And so when we look at here, blunt trauma tends to be a bit more in the lower section of the larynx. Now this isn't necessarily the lower airway, but lower section of the airway, uh, the larynx down and or sorry, the trachea, right as it kind of gets to the crinoid. We can see where the majority of blunt trauma comes from, and that's all in those lower areas. Penetrating, on the other hand, it's up high. 75% of penetrating injuries to the trachea are done up high. And then we can kind of, if you look at what would cause this, when we look in the case of trauma up there, there's less protection, lower down low. Um, it's harder to get any type of penetrating injury to that area. It can happen, um, but it has the rib cage around it and everything like that. As well as when you look at some violent uh, assaults, things like that, knives cutting throats, things like up there. And it's much easier to cut the larynx up there than trying to go through the rib cage down below, which is why we see less penetrating areas, um, both intent and just the natural anatomy of the body. Injuries with uh, surrounding the esophagus, and there's additional hearts associated with injuries surrounding the esophagus and cervical spine. So if you have a cervical spine injury, we have an issue uh, chance that we're going to have a possible tracheal injury. And then we also have the cervical spine, or sorry, the esophagus. And then we'll, sometimes we'll call it like what, a tracheal or esophageal rupture, things like that. And that's where I actually see a, what they call subcutaneous emphysema, which is air or underneath the skin and it feels like rice crisp retreats if you guys had heard of this one before uh, possibly have and um, tr uh, tracheal bronchial injuries is mainly where that comes from for uh, ours for with tracheal bronchial injuries that's where we get that esophageal um, not esophageal but subcutaneous emphysema that's the primary cause of it so when you get aspiration below about us it is a common cause of upper airway obstruction and then down in the lower. And so I'm sure many of you guys have heard in the past of uh, aspiration, aspiration pneumonia and all, everything that that kind of brings with it. And so that is a major issue that we're very concerned with as far as uh, trying to prevent and it's why we actually end up innovating most of our patients uh, our a lot of our patients is for prevention of aspiration because it can cause a huge issue and so when we look in here uh, aspiration is active inhalation of a not of a non-gaseous foreign substance in the lungs so by non-gaseous talking about um, non-air and some type of liquid and so obviously there's a few different ways that can kind of come about but a big one that we try and prevent is vomiting. And that's why we end up taking an airway many times because we're trying to prevent vomit from getting in there. So the average adult stomach has capacity about 1.4 liters and manufactures about 1.4 liters of gastric juices in each 24 hour period. Uh, it's uh, decently acidic. Our saliva itself is watery and slightly acidic where our gastric juices are very acidic. Uh, gastric juices are that hydrochloric acid as opposed to our saliva, which is a lot more neutral because it's in areas that our our body can doesn't tolerate the very acidic environment that our stomach does. And uh, consequences of an aspiration of a neutral liquid such as water is a lot easier to reverse with supportive therapy as opposed to a very caustic such as a, an acid. acid. Uh, we don't. There's not a lot of alkalotic ones that we tend to aspirate. It can be, but not necessarily. There's not a lot of them out there. Uh, but if you go and drink a bunch of Drano or something like that, then yes. That's a pretty brutal way to end yourself, and there's not a lot they can do. Even if it only goes in your esophagus, it has that very alkalotic uh, properties where it'll just melt through everything. So the path pathophysiology of aspiration. Three conditions are associated with high risk of aspiration. Diminished level of consciousness. Iodrenic obstruction. So obstructions that we put there that cause that. Iodrenic is um, health care initiated issues. Uh, mechanical dis disturbances of the airway and the GI tract, and so some even things such as bag valve masking, if you guys remember anything over 21 to 23, I believe, um, centimeter water of pressure will open up the gastric um, 
and allow air into the stomach. Uh, the more air that fills up in that stomach, the more likely that your body's going to try and vomit that. And if you're another thing that causes people to vomit a lot is you can get blood in the stomach. Uh, when you start, the blood is, the stomach doesn't like um, blood very much in there, so it tries to vomit that back up. Anything that can cause a pretty decent issue as far as causing a patient of vomiting. Uh, with the suppression of the gag reflex, um, with or without the full stomach, it, it causes an increased risk of vomiting as well, which is why when we start talking about patients who aren't staying very conscious, how we can and what um, trying to protect their airway and a decision to intubate at that point. Um, so we'll go into a little bit like this, uh, as you can see in the bottom. This also sound as all types of reasons to intubate our patient, very much so. So here's where we're gonna first start looking at our one of our first chest x-rays. As I'll go over more in class, but as we're kind of looking down, first thing you do is just start at the shoulders, you start going down. We see this light black in here in between all the uh, the white in there. Remember, white is solid objects typically, or fluid, uh, depending on what type, but it's where the x-rays are meeting a blockage of something. Some types of fluid will show up there. Other areas will, tend, will start turning more black, but blood tends to be show up white when we talk about our vessels in here, particularly black backage of fluid, so high concentrations of there, and it's mainly hitting a lot of the substances in there, um, as well as a different types of uh, pneumonia-esque things, mucus, things like that, where we'll see. And so anytime we see on here, um, so we'll start going down, and we kind of see the right main stem come over here, the left main stem's gonna kind of go off by itself. We're not gonna necessarily look in there, but that's where we can identify a tube if there is one sometimes right in here. Those are a little bit harder to see. Not, there's no expectation there, but we can see there's a difference from this left side to our right side. And all of a sudden we see all of this localized extra uh, increased cloudiness where we don't see it on this side. Uh, sometimes depending on the contrast of the x-ray, they'll make it look like this is more pneumo-esque and that's not really a pneumo. It looks like there's still air being moved through there. But the other thing that we'll kind of look at, so right up here is we kind of have our diaphragm. You should have this overarching like, kind of arch right here. Um, and this is the lever over here, kind of pushing up. It's a little bit small on this side too. But on this side, we can see the heart, and up down here is the apex of the heart. And this is our mediastinum. And then we look at all of our ribs as they go side to side to side to side, right? Uh, the difference over here is obviously we can see, because there's two giant arrows pointing towards it, but this big old cloudiness right here. This is typically indicative of a backup, or it's usually a pneumonia type thing. Um, if the patient vomited recently and there's, they're concerned about aspiration, then that identifies that, hey, most of it went right down the right main stem, ended up in this right lower lobe. And this is where we see a lot of our vomit. We'll get a lot more into chest x-rays. I'm not gonna spend an extra amount of time right now on those, but if we see some more, I'll try and identify them and just trying to continue to run through some things that help, can help you identify different things that are going wrong with our patient. So we look in here, and here's a dissected ver uh, set of lungs. That's about one centimeter, and we can see all these alveoli and tracheal uh, or bronchi and bronchus in here. So the severity of pulmonary aspiration depends on a few different things. Uh, the pH of aspirated material, so like I said, very acidotic, a acidotic or even alkalotic, but we just tend not to see nearly as much alkalotic aspirations, um, mainly because most of the acidotic aspirations that we see are from vomit and our body doesn't tend to make a ton of very alkalotic substances. There's, they're there, but um, in general, especially the one we're dealing with the airway, we're gonna see a lot of acidotic. Uh, the, so the pH, the more acid, acid and lower pH that we're dealing with, the increased amount, once again, if it's very high on the pH as well, uh, with very alkalotic, but uh, most of this being gastric content will be very low acidosis, and, uh, very low pH, so it'll be very acidotic. Uh, the volume of aspirate, so the amount of that they aspirate is huge and can be very important on there, and whether particulate matter or bacterial can take, uh, contamination are present as well. Uh, the toxic effect of lungs on gastric acid, which once again, gastric acid, that hydrochloric acid has a pH below 2.5. That is very, very, very acidic. Our body makes that for a reason, but it can be very detrimental to our lungs. Our lungs are not meant to deal with that low of pH, particularly as a gastric content as opposed to a gaseous air. Um, and so it just stays in there and it just starts burning up and causing severe damage to all the alveoli in there. So when we're looking at airway evaluation, we've looked at a couple different things, but when we're 
talking about uh, recognizing res uh, changes in the respiratory pattern. Pattern. Breathing process should be comfortable, regular, and performed without stress. And we kind of call that the, the non-effort breathing, and we're just looking at it. Um, when we start seeing different types, um, we'll talk about different types of breathing pattern and what can cause some of those issues. Not all of them are respiratory in nature. Many of them are. But some of, we'll start kind of with that inadequate respiration can occur when the body cannot compensate for increased oxygen demand and cannot maintain a normal range of O2-CO2 balance. So if they're in acute respiratory distress, and when we're going to start looking at when we need to um, innervate some things to kind of look at. So then acute respiratory re distress, we're having a failure to ventilate, a failure to oxygenate, and a failure to or failure to maintain the airway. Any three of those, we'll start looking at innervations, um, particularly when all three of those. Failure to ventilate, we'll try BLS for uh, needs. And we'll also see what is the reason. It might be an FBAO, and that might be the reason that we need to fix it, right? A foreign body airway in there will cause our us to and cause an inability to ventilate. Failure to oxygenate, something's going on that we're not able to get oxygen where we need to, and we need to get high flow oxygen to those processes. Some of those can be a VQ mismatch, that we're ventilating air through there, but because there's a, there's a big shunt where blood is moving away from the uh, lungs, or is not being oxygenated in the lungs because of a PE or something similar, there is usually still part of a uh, part of the lungs that are and so the more high flow O2 that we can get there the better and then failure to maintain the airway of any type because that has ability to have issues as far as um, aspiration and other other things that we were just talking about so supplemental oxygen therapy uh, we're talking about concentrations greater than ambient air at 21 percent administration of supplemental oxygen is element of appropriate management wide range of clinical conditions symptoms and manifestations of hypoxia particularly hypoxemia and everything else uh, if we start seeing low o2s that's when we're starting to look at when we why we need to bait or change increase peep things like that we'll get more into that So how this lecture was kind of set up by Sanders, I try not to remove too much of Sanders information on there. I'll just modify it usually. But some of this on here, it kind of, want to, it fits into this roughly, but we're going to talk about some of the different oxygen sources. I know it's a slight sidetrack, but we're kind of, kind of go through that. But the most common, common form of oxygen used in the pre-hospital setting is pure oxygen gas delivered in liters per minute. Uh, typically we're dealing with O2 cylinders. 2022 pounds per square inch sometimes you'll see those are in our standard ones um, you might see higher ones in fiberglass or other um, oxygen containers but that's what our typical psi in our o2 tanks will reach now how much the volume of o2 depends on the size of the tank so there's also what they call locks or liquid oxygen and it's been cooled till it's down into this state of liquid and you're able to haul or uh, carry more locks um, typically many times that's what the hospital has their big uh, tanks in there which just allows you to have a lot more oxygen because you can concentrate a lot more of that not a lot of transport agencies carry locks there is some particularly longer flight com companies that fly really long distance uh, flight and they know they're going to be using oxygen sometimes i'll have a locks but most of the time we don't see that out here and then we have two different things we'll call one our one is a regulator and it's used to transfer cylinder gas from tank to tank and flow meters control uh, control the volume, the amount of oxygen delivered to the patient. So regulators, what we see on most of our tanks, and the flow meters, what we see on the walls, as a general kind of rule, usually. So if a patient has spontaneous respirations, where they're going to get uh, so the support of oxygen, and there's a few different devices that we're going to deliver oxygen through. We have nasal cannula with a max standard rate of six liters per, 
a minute. Once again, the high flow nasal cannula for oxygenation denitrogenation is meant to take advantage of the high pressure that's normally non-beneficial for patients. The extra pressure creates a feedback-like effect. So it's not, that's a little bit different from the normal, but normally we see the uh, six liters per minute. Now, when you talk about the nasal cannula, the high flow nasal cannula that became very common during COVID, it's a little bit different there. Uh, it's still the same, but they add a ton of humidity so it doesn't dry out and absolutely destroy our mucous membranes in our nose. Not gonna destroy it, but uh, that high flow too, when you're talking 30, 40, 50, 60, I've seen up to 60 high uh, liters per minute of oxygen being flowed into some of those patients. They're doing, they are getting that high flow effect and it really helped save some people from intubation during COVID and some of these very ARDS-like patients. And we'll get into ARDS here. I don't know if it's this lecture, but sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, next, we're going to look at simple mask. We don't really don't see these anymore, and they typically deliver concentrations 35 to 60 percent, and can be delivered through that uh, flow rate from six to ten. Uh, partial non-rebreather has an attached O2 bag, and then there's a non-rebreathing mask. All both of those fly from 10 to 15, and that partial is usually what we use here because it has valves on there. There's a few different mod versions out there, but that's basically what we're uh, talking about. And then we have our Venturi mask. We'll kind of go over a couple things with that. But here's some different flow rates, uh, nasal cannula one to six, and it can go lower, particularly on our pediatric and neonates. Sometimes you'll see them at 0. Or 0. 0.25 liters per minute or 0. 0.5. Um, those are also usually a little bit smaller nasal cannulas, and that's all they need. Just trying to get some supportive care in there. Uh, we have our face masks, five to 10. Uh, FiO2 is going to be, which is FiO2 is our fractured of inspired oxygen. That's gonna be 40 to 60%. Face tent, we don't see a lot of these in pre-hospital. Sometimes you'll see these. Sometimes these are what go over stomas too. They'll have a kind of same mask, but it's slightly different. Uh, flow rate's 10 to 15. FiO2 is roughly 40% uh, because it doesn't have that non-rebreather. The, the, the oxygen reservoir is where it kind of goes there. And then we have uh, the Venturi mask, and that's all based off the mask, and it's very precisely controlled. They're trying to they're aiming for a very specific amount, and that's what they'll use. And it has to actually do with a little attachment, and then you should be going over that here shortly, where you're going to see um, it's this color right here, and it'll it's a very precise type thing when they're trying to get ex uh, the exact amount. And then so non-rebreathers typically 80 to 95. The true non-rebreather technically can give about 100, but usually it's about 80 to 95 percent FiO2. And then the high flow nasal cannulas, and you can see there's a bit more to these. There, uh, it's not as narrow of um, the nostril inlets uh, and it's very humidified. It's meant to try and really help these patients not have their uh, nasal mucal membranes just absolutely uh, decimated by dry air getting pushed by at a very high rate. So this is Venturi mask, depending on what color. Um, there's, I've typically seen no test questions on color specific. Usually they'll, they'll come with it, but you're gonna see uh, it's very, they're aiming for a very specific type and these are usually longer term care patients. Um, they can give a decent amount of air through there, but you, you set it at the rate that it wants and whatever color you have on there will give you the approximate FiO2 that they're getting. It's kind of a cool thing, but we don't really use them. 
So augmenting patient ventilation, some patients with spontaneous breathing, but who also have dyspnea or respiratory compromise need assistance improving airflow and oxygenation. So we talk about this with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and IPPPV. Uh, I think I had XP in there, but it's all good. And then uh, there's a few different ways that they'll get this. People have them at home all the way from just like the little nasal ones that they'll go to sleep on to the big masks that we'll use. And some are isolated to full fast face masks and they even had they started using this a little bit in, during covid too and we talk about like that astronaut looking top one and so um just meant to add positive pressure and but it's not as suffocating it actually allowed them to stay on positive pressure ventilation for longer we'll talk a little bit about this as we go into it and more and more throughout all the lectures and just try to reiterate the importance of cpap peep uh, a little bit on pip and bipap and all that fun things if we don't get to it today uh, you, by the, he, you get about three or four different types of ventilation uh, all the way up to a entry level ventilator course class throughout all the paramedic school. So importance of, of PEEP, I've talked about this a little bit before, but how some of this can really help with our oxygenation and what PEEP really does. So it so continuous positive pressure airway, or continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, provides PEEP. Uh, there's no real inspiratory pressure involved. When we talk about inspiratory pressure, that's when we talk about BiPAP or IPAP and all that. BiPAP is a brand name, and that's why you'll hear it called by other names. Um, but basically, we're adding inspiratory pressure. What this does is uh, provide a constant low flow pressure, air pressure, into our lungs, which helps keep alveoli open, and it helps keep everything else perfect. Um, allows more air the next time you take a breath to start opening up other alveoli. Sometimes this can be done really quickly, particularly like neonates we see CPAP really help uh, and inspiratory pressure really help open up those alveoli within seconds to certain ARDS like patients or other patients, uh, alveoli, emphysema based patients where it takes sometimes up to weeks to get all, to recruit some of these new alveoli. And so, and we try not do our, try to do our best not to lose those recruited alveoli. So some other things that come, and it can, be, it may benefit patients with obstructive airway disease, basically splints open those, some of those lower narrow airways and allows air to pass through. But it also, because we're having that constant low flow rate through there, they're not able to squeeze some of that air out of the alveoli, we get that air trapping. And so there's a couple different things that we can kind of see in here. Um, alveolar capillaries, we can see they're more well perfused and air's going there and we're getting gas exchange. And so we have some open initially, and then we have some collapsed. After a recruitment maneuver, we don't really do recruitment maneuvers outside of inspiratory pressure and providing PEEP to allow the body or even our inspiratory pressure to help a little bit. But we don't do anything crazy as far as recruitment maneuvers. CCT doesn't either. It's more of an RT thing and there's a little bit there. Um, but basically that fixed tidal volume, because they're given the same amount of breath every time, uh, we kept those other LVI open with PEEP, that positive end expiratory pressure. So at the end of our breath all out, we have a decent amount, or we have still some pressure in our lungs, which keeps those alveoli col from collapsing. By increasing some of that PEEP, we allow the, some more of the new inspiratory breath, that fixed tidal volume, to now inflate other breaths. And because, uh, and that other part's just talking a little bit about VQ mismatch, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, again, we'll go into a lot of this up class. So normal blood becomes oxygen when passing by well inflated and open inflated and opened alveoli. Respiratory distress, the alveoli many times can be underinflated and the oxygen doesn't have that good gas exchange. Pulmonary hypertension, there's a, there's little pulmonary flow and the vessels are too constricted or the pressure is so high that the oncotic pressure within the blood vessels doesn't allow enough of that O2 to really move over from the gas inside the alveoli into the blood. Um, when we talk about interstitial edema, transient tach, uh, tachypnea, the interstitial edema, so the third spacing of fluid gets in between the capillary beds and the blood vessels, or sorry, the capillary beds and the alveoli, and that causes a barrier that doesn't allow as much gas exchange through those. And then alveolar edema, which is some type of debris, is uh, kind of the same, but it's uh, looking at some other areas where it just causes to not enough because there's extra back of a fluid within the alveoli that not enough O2 is in the alveoli to allow that gas exchange to happen. So there's a few different other reasons that we can see in there. 
So PEEP involves improves imp PEEP improves oxygenation by increasing functional residual capacity and tidal ventilation that assists in meeting area goals by decreasing interpulmonary shunting of blood and improves the matching perfusion lung to ventilated tissue. It does not open fully collapsed alveoli, but it re-expands partially collapsed lungs. So it does help a little bit, but not a ton. And we can see up here on this waveform that as we have, so we start adding PEEP. Whether we add it from a PEEP mass, a BVM, or... Uh, CPAP some other ways. So we have this in here. This down here below, ZEEP or zero, no PEEP, tend to not use it. Those will collapse, the technically it'll collapse the alveol altogether. But when we inspiration, we have our aerated, expanded alveoli contracted, it's still not there. And so the idea here is to one, keep oxygen always going even on our exhalation and improve the amount of oxygen that's there at all times. But even on our inhaled breath, the increased amount of the partial pressure of air and particularly the partial pressure of the air pressure of air and the partial pressure of oxygen is increased even during exhalation which helps improve uh, oxygenation and gas exchange because the higher our partial pressure is within the air more of that is diffusing across and into the liquid membrane uh, across the alveolar membranes and into the circulatory system. So now we're going to talk a little bit about BiPAP. BiPAP is bilevel positive airway pressure. It combines, a partial, it combines partial ventilatory support and CPAP. So we have that continuous positive end expiratory pressure there at the baseline. We're always having a little bit of increased pressure, a little bit of airflow. And then what happens when this partial ventilatory support, when we take a breath in, it, we add extra pressure support is what we like to call it on a vent. But what you do is when you take a breath in, the whatever device we're using, whether it's the BiPAP mask that we'll see on many of the rigs now out there that recently got approved or even on a vent BiPAP, is that it, when you take that breath, it pushes more an increased amount of air in, which helps actually inflate some of those lungs and improve that our PIP, our peak inspiratory pressure, as well as our plateau pressure when we get down into the lungs. And what this allows to do is just improve our oxygenation. And so the actual, here is our um, the actual airway pressures, just kind of with just CPAP that we're never going down to zero, but that we're kind of breathing, our normal breath, and then our PEEP is not getting lower than this line. And so our mean arterial pressure is kind of staying right there in the middle, or not arterial pressure, but our mean airway pressures kind of right here in the middle. So that's what that kind of dotted line is showing. And then we talk about IPAP versus EPAP, E's expiratory positive airway pressure or CPAP. There's a few different names. It's all more or less the same thing, kind of just in different forms. So if I say EPAP, think of PEEP. IPAP, think of PIP or inspiratory pressure because it's in inspiratory positive airway pressure. And so we see the actual airway pressures within the, the airways. It's going to be a little bit different depending on what part of the airways, but this is the general generality throughout is that we maintain this PEEP at the bottom end. And then when we add that inspiratory pressure, we increase it all the way up. And so our airway pressures actually um, increase and we increase oxygenation that way. So it, it provides that pressure differences between inspiratory positive airway pressure and expiratory positive airway pressure and really just helps improve oxygenation and air movement. Um, you can adjust some of the different ones to be titrated. So when we reach a desired range, we kind of move it. Many settings, you'll kind of go with a PEEP of five or EPAP or PEEP of five and an inspiratory pressure of 15. Um, there's a few different vents and different ones that you'll look at, but the, the pressure difference is 10. That difference in pressure is also what we like to call driving pressure and that driving pressure, high driving pressure. So the bigger difference between EPAP, that bottom line of our PEEP and our pot and the top end of our inspiratory pressure, particularly positive in, uh, inspiratory pressure, the larger the difference between there they've show they've shown has a increased risk of barotrauma because you're pushing more air in harder and faster and if you think like a fist the harder and faster you punch the more damage you can cause so think about that that the harder and faster you're causing that inspiratory pressure is you're going to cause that increased barotrauma and that the more that we increase there it also correlates directly with tidal volume so the bigger bear our driving pressure the more tidal volume we have because the total amount of air that we're moving in and out is the difference it's measured in volume versus pressure so when we're talking about in pressure 
it's called a driving pressure, but the amount of volume that we're moving in is our tidal volume. And the increased tidal volume is also what causes barotrauma. So that's kind of the differences um, they're talking about. If, when I get in class, when we do this lecture in class, I will talk a little bit more about and try and draw a little bit on the board so it helps at least clarify this difference between in driving pressure. So procedure for, procedure for administering CPAP uh, varies depending on device. We'll pull out both the BiPAP and the CPAP masks that, we'll, that are now in the valley, and we'll go over both. They're relatively easy here. There's some other vent-based ones that get a little bit more com uh, complicated, but it's, those are still easy. And I will show you guys how to do all this on a vent as well. Intermittent positive pressure ventilation and or intubation should be considered if the patient is removed from CPAP therapy. And so if they can't tolerate CPAP and they're continuing to get worse, that's when we tube them, is what that last sentence says. So if CPAP's not working, they're not able to tolerate, they're trying to pull it off. Sometimes we'll talk about using a uh, sedative a little bit to try and relax them from being anxious because sometimes they're so altered from being hypoxic that they're combative and they're not wanting the CPAP mask on. It makes them feel suffocated. So if we can relax them a little bit, usually out of bands the best. But Versed is what we have in the field. It works decently enough. It's just a little bit harder hitting and faster. Out of bands a little bit mellower and longer lasting. You know, they both have the same effects overall. Um, and so what you do, you give a little, C, uh, little benzo to try and relax them a little bit. And that will help. And so they'll tolerate the mask more to improve their oxygenation. And then watch, all of a sudden they'll become not that altered anymore. But however, they can also get worse. That's not necessary in orders, but you can call for those orders relatively easy. And we had those as standing orders with flight and some places do. It's a pretty common thing and you might see it in the hospital some. So our positive end expiratory pressure maintains a degree of positive pressure at the end of exhalation. In the pre-hospital setting, we can be provided transport ventilation or through a PEAT valve or through CPAP. Um, when we're talking about it in a mask, it's really hard to do on a mask itself without the patient being too, because it's really hard to maintain that. However, if you are bagging a patient, you're trying to just to maintain PEAP, and you haven't, and you decided not to tube them or not, you can still throw on a CPAP mask and just attach the BVM with a PEAT valve to it, and it works the same. In fact, you're providing BiPAP because you're providing positive end expiratory pressure with a PEAT valve right here, and then you're also adding um, inspiratory pressure with each bag assisted bag valve mask that we're giving, or uh, bag mouth breath that we're giving. So ventilation can be provided by several methods in the pre-hospital setting, um, include rescue breathing, mouth to mask, mask to mask, no mask to stoma, Please don't put your mouth on a stomach, that's gross. Um, but bag valve, uh, bag mask valve devices and automatic transport ventilators. The city recently had some ma uh, ventilators and many EMS agencies throughout have at least some type of ventilators. I'll talk more about it in semester four when we go over uh, ventilation and I, I will do a ventilator class to at least have you guys prepared more so than anything. One, if you ever run out of an agency that ends up having these, it's not, it's a ALS skill. Uh, most, a lot of areas just don't end up having those. Uh, something else, uh, rescue beating, we don't need any other patient. Um, oh, and also one thing that I talk about with ventilators is that I will teach you guys enough that so, so when you guys go to a facility, uh, maybe call 911 because the vent's not working, blah, 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 CTT, CCT's not available, how to translate what you're seeing on a vent to a bag valve mask and how to get the same more or less effects without causing our patient to die before we get there. So cool thing, some uh, cool things, some interesting things about rescue breathing and some things that they want us to know. Inspired air has oxygen concentration by 21%, uh, no equipment needed, immediately available. All right. The first one is mask to, there's mask to mask, uh, mouth to mask, mouth to nose, if you have one of these devices or you use it, particularly you'll see these more, a little bit in uh, some wilderness stuff when they, because it's easier. Although there's some full, really compact PBMs now that are pretty easy. All right, ventilation to infants and children, very similar technique described for mouth to mask breathing differences, position pain with slight head tilt, chin sufficient to open the airway during ventilation, the mask should cover both mask, uh, then mouth and nose of an infant or small child up to one year of age, exhale until the chest rises, when allowed for passive exhalation, break contact with the mask, uh, provide ventilations at a rate of 12 to 20, one breath every three to five seconds, advanced airway, reduce eight to 10, deliver each breath over one second, make sure the chest rises. Mastostoma method, yep. Uh, stoma ventilation, that is the same as other ones. You can put a mask over there, do that. I will we'll go over um, tracheal changes with that, uh, or how to change the tubes and all those, because that's a relatively easy skill that we can do. If they already have a stoma, we can stick a tube in there and not have to deal with this. If or just change out one that they might already have. 
Uh, some other ones, bag valve masks. So what we'll see on the right is a flow inflating bag or anesthesia bag. Uh, most neonate bags out of EMS, outside of EMS actually use these. And we had them for flight. However, most BVMs are self-inflating bags, which you see over the right. They each have a different thing. If you don't have a good mask seal with a flow inflating mask, uh, that bag won't fill up. But that does provide PEEP just by holding there. However, by just by holding a mask over our patient uh, with the BVM, a self-inflating bag, we do not provide PEEP or provide passive oxygenation. A very slow amount of oxygen gets transferred down into the air and it's a amount that can try and suffocate our patient. So don't just hold over a mask without breathing for them. However, it's a flow inflating bag, uh, like the one over on the left, then yes, we can, and you can hold it there. And if they're breathing on their own, all you're doing is providing CPAP. So talked about this before, but smaller uh, bags are important, but here's some interesting things on a couple of the bags that you'll see out there. It's why the city's new bag is really cool. I really like it. Um, a lot smaller total tidal volume. So when we talk about an Ambu bag or Lairdal bag, uh, the total volume inside those BVMs is absolute volumes, 1,500 and 1,600. The tidal volume that can easily move through there is 600, child. And so we can see some of these differences and why we don't want to crush the entire BVM when we're going in there. It's also why during scenarios, if I, I might be asking you particularly when we're at SimMen, the one in the ambulance, hey, what do you think, how much air you're pushing through? And it's not a especially with the, um, the when the patient's tubed, is uh, I'll just trying to get you guys an idea of the amount of air you're pushing through. I'm not necessarily just saying you're good or bad. It might just be showing, yeah, you're right at where you need to be, good job, or hey, maybe you do need to make a small adjustment. Um, it's not meant to be punitive or anything. And that just give you an idea of what you, were, what you should be um, given. Several types of time cycled gas powered auto, uh, automatic transport ventilators are available. The volume of gas delivered by the automatic ventilators determined by the length of time the manual trigger is depressed or by the inspiratory effort of the spontaneous speaking patient. We'll go over more events later in class. I will get you guys uh, uh, decently aware. Uh, science and technology produce many devices providing airway management. Paramedic not, must not neglect the basic airway management procedures. We'll talk about a few of these. Uh, manual airways. This is going to be your first. Remember we talked about that the tongue is a huge reason that uh, airway becomes obstructed in an obtunded or unconscious patient and that we need to be on top of that to try and make sure we are providing the best care for our patients and that we can easily fix some of these. And so the head tilt chin is preferred method for open airway when spinal injury is not suspected. Jaw thrust may be used to gain additional forward displacement of the mandible if no spinal injury is suspected, but jaw thrust, uh, but the, uh, other, the head tilt chin is not quite doing it. Sometimes adding a jaw thrust and even if it's not a trauma patient can be useful or a spinal injury is not suspected can be useful. And we'll kind of go over some of that. Suction. Suction can be used to remove vomit, saliva, blood, food, and other foreign objects that may block airway or increase the likelihood of pulmonary aspiration by inhalation. If we'll talk about how to innervate this patient. It is, that looks pretty gnarly. Uh, possible GSW. I don't know the full story behind that one, but that we'll talk about it. The main one there is you're going to try and one salad is going to be your best friend. You're going to try and if uh, all the, that's a little bit coagulated, so some of that blood is not very what we're used to seeing. But with that. Uh, if you see bubbles, follow the bubbles. That is your best bet. Uh, lead with suction till you get down there. And I'll teach you some other airway uh, rescue techniques that can, might be able to be very beneficial in a patient like this, especially in, during like salad. Um, but using the catheter as a uh, rescue device. And we'll go over that later. See manual suction. He's actually worked relatively well. Uh, we have one in the ambulance, in our ambulance, and I'll show you to you guys. Uh, kind of nice because you don't ever have to worry about it being charged and it works pretty dang well. Um, just provides that negative pressure. So basically you squeeze this, it opens up the entire, that xylophone type structure, expands the total volume in there, creating a lower pressure than what's in there. And it actually pulls up relatively well. Um, then we'll talk about, show a couple other ones, manual ones, but do some enough. So then we'll talk about suction catheters. We have the standard Yankauer way back in 1908, by Dr. Yankauer, meant for suctioning out. Um, blood clots, things like that, decanto. There's also the big stick. The big stick is very similar to decanto, except it's more traditionally 
it follows more like a Mac blade type bend where this is more hyper angulated. This is meant to be used with uh, uh, a hyper angulated blade if needed. Uh, decanter works great all around. I love it. Uh, one cool thing about decanter too is it doesn't have a finger hole up there, a carb type thing where you put your finger over to uh, initiate suction. So it allows you to do uh, solid a little bit easier. And if you're going to try and solid without that, with a big stick, which is very similar, but you have to have a hole, you just have to sometimes put a piece of tape over there and it works just fine. Just keep your finger on there. Uh, what's the tip? Catheter's narrow, flexible tube, tonsil tip. Yep, got there, decanto. Before any section again, all equipment should be checked. Yep, can you shift? I do that. Then we have our soft suctioning. Um, we have our tube, our just normal tube suctioning. Every truck should have some of these. On the down below here is what we call a ballard. Uh, they're usually at facilities, whether that facility is a um, hot, um, big hospital or even just a nursing home or anything like that. And what they'll do, it allows you just to suction without having to unhook the patient from a ventilator or BVM and just suction. But yeah, it's kind of nice for some of those patients where we don't want, whether um, for a disease process or just don't want to take that off and stop ventilation, we can do that real quick. Gastric extension results from trapping bare in the stomach, managing gastric extensions by slightly increasing the bag valve mask inspiration time. And um, then we'll also talk about measuring NG and OG, NG from the tip of the nose to the earlobe down to the xiphoid process. Right out here, you make that mark and then you just go ahead and low, uh, put it down to the esophagus. Just, it's a blind insertion method and do that. Uh, NG from there for OG from the corner of the mouth and same earlobe down to the xiphoid process a couple inches past that. It doesn't have to be exactly there. You're just trying to get a rough estimate because it just needs to end up somewhere in the stomach. We want to aim for like two to three centimeters past the cardiac sphincter, which is where that roughly gets us with these measurements. But it's not an exact science because it's kind of hard to exactly determine. Uh, such gastric distension is very common in patients who have been ventilated but not yet intubated. NG decompression, uh, measure the patient, put it in, and just make sure it doesn't coil at the back of the throat and confirm placement. If you're ever going to do a conscious one, we don't do it that often anymore, but we, uh, particularly when we had activated charcoal and you do it on a conscious patient who may or may be slightly uncooperative, we go ahead and uh, put it down into their stomach. But before we dump a bunch of charcoal in there, because that would be a huge aspiration issue, we have them talk because if it's in the trachea, they can't talk because the cords can't move uh, correctly. And so they won't be able to talk if it's in the trachea. If they can't talk, pull it out and try again. Don't put anything down into there or try and suction things out if it's in the trachea. Try and do it, particularly more for adding like activated charcoal. Uh, OG de decompression, same as NG, uh, except you're starting at the corner of the mouth. It's easier on a two. Uh, if a patient that's innervated, go ahead and throw an OG in. It's almost easier. It's usually easier than NG. Conscious patients, NG is a, little more comfortable, a lot more comfortable. Uh, gastric extension can be uncomfortable for the patient, may induce nausea, vomit, even when the gap re reflex is suppressed. In addition, they interfere with mass seals. They also interfere with visualization of airway and of uh, structures during intubation. That's why we typically do it after intubations. Um, complications of the procedure include nasals, epidural, and gastric trauma, tracheal placement, and gastric tubes. Why do we not put it in the if, in the head trauma, particularly the basilar skull fracture? That's where they always like be cautious with an MPA. An MPA is going to have a real hard time in there, but they have a basilar skull fracture. So a basilar skull fracture is a fracture on the base of the skull on the inside of the skull all around here. It's where we get the raccoon eyes and the battle signs, all things like that, that we learned there, uh, where CSS coming out the nose. It's because there's CSS leaking directly there. If you have CSS coming out of the nose, do not put anything in that nose, please, for the love of goodness. Um, this is an NG tube that they placed in here in a basal skull fracture. It went right up there and wrapped around the brain. Bad day. All right, so when do we innovate and why? This question always comes up and we're going to address it. I think we hit a number of areas of things was we're kind of talking about this previously last week and a bit today but now we're going to actually talk about when we innovate and why we innovate so class will have a little bit more discussion reasons to innovate airway mouth neck infections tumor foreign body airway bleeds so on our exam we hear strider voice change mishandling of secretions airway posturing difficult intubation is going to be very likely with those upper airway obstructions Intubate early in dynamic airways, such as neck trauma, um, anaphylaxis, or angioedema. If it's swelling up in there, we need to get a tube in there sooner. Um, the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. 
thermal and burns, um, they swell up and they get extremely edematous as well. And we need to be on top of that quick, fast, and in a hurry. Uh, so that's in our airway reasons. Those are ones we're going to innovate early. Breathing, failure of oxygenation or ventilation, often minimal to non-invasive ventilation and medical therapies. We used to tube a lot more prior to getting CPAP back in 2013, 12, uh, at least in this system. Uh, once we get that, our innovations went down because we didn't have to intubate people to get this positive pressure ventilation. And we were able to actually help them stay off the vent and not die as much. Um, it helped out a lot. So circulation, so augment tissue oxygenation by delivering, by delivering, by unloading muscles of respiration. That means because of all of our accessory muscle use, our patients get too tired of breathing, particularly in sepsis, and their their respiratory rate because they're trying to blow off so much o, um, CO2 and increase their oxygenation is just cooking. It's just moving quick, fast. It's breathing a ton. When this happens, all those accessory muscles used because they're also having labor breathing is now a ton. It, it's just going, 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 and the muscles that because if you guys remember, skeletal muscles use a ton of extra uh, oxygen to work. They produce both more lactic acid and then they also, and, and sepsis is a very acidic, lower pH illness, um, as well as it uses a ton of oxygen. Or they're using as much oxygen to try and breathe and help their breathing as they are, and so it's going to the breathing process instead of actually helping us uh, going to the other parts of the body where they also need oxygen. And so by innovating our patients and taking over manual ventilation for them, CPAP can help, a BiPAP can help, but many times what they need is a tube and a ventilator. And prior to a ventilator, us breathing for them. So if they're becoming so tired, we can help increase, we can um, decrease their respiratory effort and output of their muscles and allow their lungs to rest and allow us to breathe, them for, breathe for them. So then disability, CNS catastrophes, catastrophes such as traumas, depression, um, if we give some Narcan, it kind of works a little bit and then goes right back. They could be on a number of different types of uh, opiate-based medications or benzos or a combo. And the little bit of Narcan we're doing is not doing enough. And so we're going to have to take over the airway. Status epilepticus, sometimes we just need their entire body to stop. Uh, we Sometimes we have to do it via paralyzation or sometimes we just go heavy, heavy benzos. Um, and we need them to stop seizing. However, if we use... RSI and paralytics, many times their brain is continuing to seize, even though the rest of their body is, it's still better than not uh, because they're not having the in every muscle in their body contracting and spasming. And so it's not using all that oxygen. So it allows the brain to get more oxygenated, but the brain's still firing and they need to fix that. Sometimes it's via Kepa, uh, Fosfenitin, or Dilantin, and uh, Orfenitin. And if not, they'll go to barbiturates and hopefully that'll stop it. And if not, they might code, but wouldn't die. However, that is um, a reason to innovate or some type of bad head trauma. So then the, the last couple ones, expected or or expected course or anticipated decline. This patient is going to decline soon. And we want to get ahead of that and we want to resuscitate before we innovate, right? But if we expect them to decline and that they're starting to crash, we'd rather get the tube while their vital signs can take this without coding than have the patient code afterwards. So, um, this anticipated decline, you're getting ahead of the game because you know this patient's going to buy a tube in the next five to 10 minutes and you're choosing to intubate now. And they might have a GCS of 15 or 13, but you're noticing them start to decline rapidly and you know where this is going and you're deciding to, t to take the airway ahead of time. So you're not causing them to code or have a agnostic brain injury when you code, uh, when they do intubate. There's all types of reasons that we were ex this anticipated course expected course, anticipated course, anticipated decline. You're expecting them to crash, so you're getting ahead of the game, getting secure in that airway, so then you can resuscitate the rest of the patient and also making sure that the airway procedure doesn't cause them to code. Uh, sometimes a transfer radiology or other institution where you're going to need. Sometimes a need for immediate aggressive sedation to protect patient as well as others, and so we knock them down and intubate. Um, as well, if they have something else going, but they're altered as well, and they'll do this, you're going to see flight companies do this quite a bit more because they can reach up and just start slapping the uh, controls, causing the whole aircraft to crash, but we still need to transport this patient. It still needs to go by flight. And so what we'll do is we'll, we will electively intubate. And in fact, um, sometimes if I need to in the aircraft, I would have rock first to paralyze them and then sedate them. 
not fantastic. We don't usually need to do that on the ground, but the reason behind that was to try and help the patient uh, by not crashing us. So there's a little bit different there, some incidents in flight where you're gonna use this a little bit more. So these are all reasons to intubate. So some indications for intubation. Is the patient able to maintain their air, own airway? If no, find a tube. Is the patient able to ventilate effectively? No. Can we fix it with BLS maneuvers? No, all right. Now we need the most likely buying a tube. Is the patient able to oxygenate effectively? Can we improve FiO2? Can we try CPAP? Can we try P uh, and IPAP? Does that not work? All right, try buying a tube. Is the patient expected to acutely deteriorate to the point that failing to manage the airway will create future complications? If that's a true, then we're tubing. Is GCS, is GCS less than eight on here? Many people say that and the, and, I don't like that saying in the sense that it causes people to just want to, oh, GCS less than eight, let's go ahead and innovate. I've not two people, GCS is a three. They were maintaining the airway somehow greatly. They were just non-responsive. Not common, but I, I've chosen not to innovate a patient or two like that. And I've also innovated a patient at 15 because I could see where this was going and a couple times I didn't and I should have. So now should GCS be a reason to innovate? Yes, if GCS less than eight, you should use that as a indicate. If their GCS is eight, start thinking in your mind. Use it as a totality of everything going on. We'll talk about a couple of different things too that we can look at. High ETCO2s, typically above like 55, 60, somewhere in there. They're failing to ventilate. Their ETCO2 is building up so much. It's usually from, particularly from respiratory failure, that, hey, this is a good time if it's a respiratory failure, respiratory distress type call. They're not ventilating well enough to breathe off all this CO2 that, that they're uh, building up. Good reason to innovate. Low FiO2, or sorry, low SpO2 uh, used to be like 80s. We might look at it. Uh, COVID changed that a little bit down. I've seen patients sitting up and talking to me in the like, mid 60s. It was a very confusing time, but we recognize some different areas we can try and not. Um, but uh, anywhere around the 60s, if your SpO2 is in the 60s, innovate F, uh, ETCO2. If they're both there, 100% innovate. As far as like decently hard numbers, if your SpO2 and your ETCO2 are the same number, look at innovating, particularly like 60s or 70s, yeah. Um, it's just showing a failure to ventilate and to oxygenate. Uh, GCS less than eight is a reason because they lose, There's it should be one of the extra things that goes, they're less than eight, are they able to maintain their airway? If that in conjunction with their overall patient condition, yes, use that. If it's a way to help you remember that area where they start losing the effectiveness to manage the airway, go for it, but don't use it just, oh, their GCS is less than eight, innovate. That's kind of my whole thing on there. Just use the overall clinical condition of your patient, not just. All right, guys, if you have any questions, let me know. We'll talk about this more in class. We'll have some hopefully better discussions on there. And uh, I'll see you guys then. Talk to you later.